Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this next session. Uh, this session is about the ODPI, uh, which is one of the um, foundations that are part of the Linux Foundation. The aim of this uh, session today is to talk a little bit about the purpose of the foundation, but also to uh, talk through some of the projects that we have. Um, we are also looking for new projects relating to data. So if you like what you hear, like the way that we work um, and have a project to suggest, then uh, please feel free to contact us through the ODPI web page. So the ODPI has actually been around since 2015. Um, its role initially was to help the different um, Hadoop vendors um, they were all shipping different versions of the components that make up the Hadoop platform uh, to come together and have um, a agreed set of standards as to which versions they were using in combination um, and uh, other aspects that would help an organization that was using a, um, Hadoop to, um, um, to be able to switch between uh, different suppliers of the um, uh, different suppliers of the uh, uh, of the Hadoop platform, and uh, that was that was very successful, and it it created important discussions and, and uh, between the vendors. Now, of course, um, uh, the number of Hadoop vendors has uh, um, continuously uh, diminished in the in the last couple of years, and so uh, the ODPI was uh, looking um, that it really didn't have a, a role anymore. Um, however, uh, there was a strong belief that the data space is an important space for open source. In fact, there's a lot of open source in um, supporting the data space. And so uh, the ODPI looked for a new role. And at the moment, we have, um, uh, it says not sharing my slides. So how do I do that? Let's do that. OK, that looks a little better. All right. So let me uh, let me continue. So apologies for the technical um, the technical issues. Uh, so we're now looking at the uh, the, the, uh, the header page for uh, this this deck, and you can see that the title is uh, ODPI making data better. So I was talking a little bit about the history of the ODPI and the fact that it um, uh, that that, that it, it was a foundation that originally started around the Hadoop platform, but felt that going going forward, even though that there were um, a, a much fewer and fewer um, suppliers of Hadoop now. Uh, that there was still a role for um, a, a foundation focused on data. Um, and about that time, um, there were a number of projects starting. And so uh, the ODPA moved into a new phase. And that's that's actually what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so if you look at our website, uh, you'll see that we're still very focused on big data platforms and how you use data um, at scale um, for things like artificial intelligence um, and other types of uh, technologies that make use of um, a large amount of data. Uh, and we're still focused on very much on uh, bringing additional value to an organization based on their use of data. Uh, and this, um, for, for many organizations, they've had a past where they focus very much on the data belonging to applications, and maybe they extract that data and build a data warehouse. But uh, um, um, with uh, new technologies like um, AI, there was a, a there's a much greater opportunity to use data beyond creating reports through a data warehouse. Uh, so that's the, the the sort of the area that we that we're focused on. Um, and if I show what we are today, so as you can see here, the ODPI is this blue box. Uh, we have a board um, since we are um, a sort of a, our, our own uh, um, organization, nonprofit organization. Uh, then we have a technical steering committee. Um, and I lead the technical steering committee, which is uh, why I'm talking to you today. Um, and uh, under there, we have three active projects. Um, and uh, these are the projects that are um, currently active. And as I say, we are always looking for new projects. So uh, if you have any suggestions, then uh, then we're, we're very happy to, to hear from you. So the idea of the Technical Steering Committee is to basically act as a set of mentors to 
the projects as they come into the organization and each month we share the status and and uh, between the different leaders of the projects so that they can see and pick up on best practices and good ideas from from any of the uh, any of the other projects um, and so um, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about the projects that uh, we're um, that we're um, getting involved in. But what you'll notice is this isn't just about code. Uh, for many organizations, as they try to become more data driven, they face um, cultural issues, organizational issues, as well as technological issues. Because for many organizations, they operate um, as a sort of hierarchy, a control hierarchy that creates um, silos between each of the different um, IT systems. And to make use of data, you have to sort of break down those silos and allow data and uh, collaboration to flow laterally across the organization, as well as um, learn, there's all the learning and new skills in terms of how to treat, how to sort of manage it, keep it safe, uh, and also how to have um, a proper understanding of um, how much data can be believed and the sort of appropriate use, its appropriate use. So we focus not just on technology, but we also focus on best practices um, and, um, and education. And uh, you'll see that as we go through the projects. Um, so I'm gonna start with our newest project, um, which is called Open DS for All, which is actually, if you spell it out, it's Open Data Science for All. And this is actually a project focused entirely on education. Um, so the leaders of this project are Anna and Andre, and uh, they are providing a lot of energy and leadership um, to bring this project to, um, to, to a, a, a very mature state very rapidly. Um, and what they're aiming to do is to create material that universities, colleges, uh, organizations all over the world can use to build their own data science curriculum. So it's all the building blocks that uh, the educators need uh, to customize their own environment. Everything they use is open source, making it easy for um, people all over the world to take advantage of this, uh, this technology. So um, the charts that I'm showing you have, have come from them. So uh, they take credit for, um, for, the, for the content. But uh, um, what they have here is a, an illustration of actually the demand for um, data science skills is far exceeding the ability of universities, colleges, et cetera, to actually deliver them. And uh, for a lot of um, places, they actually don't have people with the, the, the skills needed to build the curriculum. So um, the aim here is to support the educators as they uh, as they build these programs. Um, the, uh, let's press the right button, okay. Um, and uh, the, when we talk about uh, the, you know, sort of the educators, it's not just universities, it's actually a, a wide range of, um, uh, of organizations that can take advantage of the material that's being created. Um, and uh, and you know the delivery could be face to face or um, in today's world um, in a digital manner as well. Um, so I said earlier on that, th that this is all open source and that's actually very important. So the programming language used is Python. It's developed in uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, and uh, they make use of the data is provided. There are um, presentations. Actually, the, the, the non-open source pieces that the presentations are in PowerPoint slides. Um, however, they're all um, shared as part of this um, uh, of this project. Um, the initial versions was were built by professors at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, so they have um, a very good uh, initial heritage. Um, and uh, the, pod, the the initial version of, of it was has been available since February this year. So the material is very up to date, created by experts, um, and there is a very lively team of people from um, some uh, very um, uh, knowledgeable organisations that are working on the technical steering committee for Open Data Science for All. So I talked about the ODPI's technical steering committee looking after 
the uh, all of the projects of the ODPI and the Data Science for All Technical Steering Committee are um, uh, experienced people in data science who are overseeing all the contributions coming into the Data Science for All. So this uh, material is, is being uh, very well groomed and validated before it's made available. So I'm going to show you some some charts from the uh, from GitHub, um, and GitHub is our it, across the ODPI. GitHub is our key delivery mechanism. It's the way that we collaborate and share information, uh, and provide information about any calls that we're doing and uh, um, other types of projects where we're looking for um, help. So this is the the main page for the data uh, for Open Data Science for All. Uh, which gives a view of um, the goals of the project, uh, who, are, who the audience is, uh, hints and tips on how to use it. And here you can see all the different types of, of modules that have been provided today and, uh, um, and details of the content. And uh, then if you go drill down into GitHub itself, what you'll see are the um, modules that are available um, and you can drill down again and you'll see the content for each of the modules and which as i say it's 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 uh, available for you to download use change um, do whatever you like um, and hopefully if you've got some new insights and some new content maybe even a new module uh, then you can use um, the GitHub processes, you can create an issue describing what type of contribution you'd like to make um, and, um, and then provide the material through the pull request mechanism uh, and the technical steering committee for Data Science for All will, will, ha will have a look at it um, and uh, probably have a conversation with you and hopefully uh, bring it into the Data Science project. Uh, so that's uh, um, Open Data Science for All. Um, and um, there's at, at the, the uh, at the moment they are still looking to expand the teams, uh, looking for people who are interested in creating new content, um, and people who actually want to be part of the team that uh, validate new content coming in from from different contributors. And they're also looking for um, contacts with uh, organisations that are interested in becoming adopters. Um, and providing a bit of advertising for on their use, you know, maybe maybe um, provide a, a blog post, connect with the team, um, talk about the work that they're doing and using the project to um, to help spread knowledge that this very valuable resource is available uh, for anyone to use. Um, and so if you have any suggestions, content, uh, volunteers, uh, please contact either Andre or uh, Anna. Uh, you can connect through to the team on uh, GitHub and uh, um, as I say, it's a very exciting project, a new project and something that uh, has the potential to offer a lot of uh, value to the world as we need to, to grow our data science skills um, across the board. So um, any questions? Let me just double check whether there are any questions for me around uh, the um, around data science for all. Let me just give a little pause for that. Um, what I'm going to do is go through each of the projects and um, you can ask me questions um, either sort of towards the end of that project or while it's going while I'm talking about it. And I will also have time at the end to talk about it to give you a further opportunity to ask um, anything else that you're interested in. OK. Uh, so let's move on to our second project, which is we started with the youngest. Um, oh, wait a minute. So we've got what level is this target at? Um, I would say um, undergraduates and below. So, it, so it's really uh, it's designed to take someone with little to no skill um, in data science, obviously educated to a fairly reasonable level through to, um, you know, to, 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 to actually being reasonably knowledgeable. So that was the question. So the question was, what level is this targeted at, the material targeted at? OK, so let me uh, go on a little bit to our second project. And as I said, the, the, um, 
and this is called BI and AI. So uh, the Open Data Science for All is the um, is the young, youngest project, and BI and AI is the oldest project. And it actually came from the um, it was came from as it was originally a special interest group in the ODPI when ODPI was very focused on Hadoop and uh, the big data space. Um, and um, Cupid, who leads this project, um, has always been um, very interested in how business intelligence and artificial in intelligence come together, particularly in a world of, of big data. So if you think about most business intelligence platforms they use for reporting in large organizations, and they have at their doorstep um, a huge um, range of data sources that have been specially prepared to support the reporting process. So that's a very valuable source of data uh, that could be used for AI. Uh, there are also uh, very mature user interfaces, displays uh, of the you know the data processing capabilities in in business intelligence platforms. So how would AI fit into that in, into that environment? So that's really the the goal of the project, um, but also to help um, BI vendors extend into the new world of AI, um, taking advantage of of their heritage. Um, so the, the team has been going um, a fair while now, um, as I say, because they were one of the original. So there's been some very interesting uh, collaborative uh, pieces of work done between the different BI vendors on, um, on their approaches to bringing AI into that type of, uh, in that type of world. Uh, and uh, this next project that they're working on, so they tend to do sort of a, a project a year. The current project is actually very exciting because this is about uh, defining a standard interface for a bridge to allow um, AI models to be plugged into a BI platform. So the first phase that they're working on now is uh, around the specification for this bridge between AI and, and BI. Um, and so there are the key vendors uh, for BI platforms are sitting working together to say what should this interface look like. Um, and the second phase is uh, will be actually to to build a, um, a reference implementation of that bridge that the uh, vendors can each use to demonstrate uh, the bridge operating with their platform. Um, and so, in, so the first phase, we're, we're looking for people with architectural um, or knowledge of a particular BI platform. In the second phase, we will be looking for um, to add developers into this e e environment so because then we can actually build the code for the bridge itself. Uh, so as I say, a very interesting platform or a project around how we uh, get uh, bring AI into a BI platform and also make use of uh, the data that's associated uh, with business intelligence um, in order to uh, um, create new insights through the use of AI models. Okay, so B is a really good question here. So what is BI, what an acronym for? So BI stands for business intelligence. It's a, it's a marketing term. So these platforms are typically uh, the, the product that um, is used to create an, um, reports for an enterprise. So it will display charts and dashboards and things like that. So that's, that's what, it, uh, what it means. And, and most of them have now been um, extended to support analytics. Uh, so not just uh, building um, a view over the data, but also to analyze it, to do um, uh, simple analytics like predictive analytics based on that data. And now um, there's further interest in expanding that to support artificial intelligence as well. So good question. Okay, any more questions around the BI and AI world? So again, we've had one project that's very uh, focused on providing education resources to um, uh, to organizations around the world. And this one is about uh, um, taking uh, something that is uh, very powerful and, and valuable to many organizations, the BI platform, and bringing, um, and bringing new capability to it 
in, term, uh, in terms of bringing artificial intelligence into that environment. Okay, so I am going to transition to the third project. Uh, and then this project um, is, uh, has been going for about two years. Oh, we've got a, um, so we're talking about, uh, the, the next question is, are there any specific open source AI models or communities that the BI and AI uh, project is working with at the Linux Foundation or whatever? Um, so uh, at the moment, I don't believe there are. I think uh, there has been a sort of call for participation and most of the people involved in it are people who work directly for vendors. So if there are suggestions or people listening today that would say, actually, I would really, it would be great to get my AI project, my AI modeling tool into this discussion. I'd like to be a part of the conversation. Uh, then please again contact us and we would be delighted to hear from you because the broader the perspective that we have on these projects and the better the results. So again, another another great question. And uh, as I say, we, volunteers are always, um, always welcome um, at the ODPI. Uh, just give people a minute or so to make sure I'm not missing any questions. So I think I've got them all. Okay, very good. Right, so I'm going to talk about the third project, um, which is uh, called ODPI Algeria. Um, and this project is two years old. Um, it is a combination of a code project and an education project or best practices project. Um, and uh, it's say like, two years old. Um, however, it um, before it was um, it, it was started, um, there were a, a couple of years of um, talking to different organizations about why they found becoming data-driven so difficult. And one of the topics that came out uh, in many, um, uh, in many uh, organizations was that every tool seems to support the ability to store information about the data that they have to build up what's called a data catalog and to add extra information to that, maybe it's the profile of the data, maybe it's the structure of the data, maybe it's the classification of the data. Um, but each tool uh, repository the, or catalog or metadata repository um, is completely proprietary and uh, locked down. So if you buy a tool suite from another vendor, you're starting again gathering that information. And many of them have tried to build bridges between them to allow that exchange of metadata. And it's proved quite brittle and very expensive for many organizations. And so the result was that different professions in their organization or different business units within their organization were operating in isolated silos and knowledge wasn't being shared. I talked earlier that a data-driven organization needs knowledge and data to flow laterally between the different silos. And the tools were actually um, reinforcing the silos um, between, uh, you know, um, because of the fact that they use these locked out, these, uh, these sort of private metadata repositories. The other thing that was happening was that um, regulations were becoming much more widespread around an organization's use of data and we're looking at it uh, from an external perspective. And so I'm gonna use the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation as an example, or GDPR. Now this particular regulation uh, talks about the fact that an individual has rights over their data. So even though an organization may have collected data about that individual and this is paying for storage and processing and keeping up to date, the individual themselves still has some rights. And it also has provision for um, those rights, including the fact that the organization has to keep that data protected, can only use it for the purposes that that individual allow, um, and also will delete it if the individual asks. Now, these sound very data oriented, but actually they, when you start looking at how you implement that in an organization, you need to make sure that um, the infrastructure is secure that the security processes around it are good, um, and that there's a good knowledge of where the data is located and how it's being used by the organization. And when an organization is very siloed, not just in the way their data is uh, is stored, but also in the way that um, 
They might have a team at doing security. They might have a team managing infrastructure. They might have a team doing data governance. They might have another team doing privacy. And all of these teams have their own tools and they need to come together. So not only do we need to bring together tools relating to that describe and work with data, we also need to bring together the tools that different professionals, different governance teams use so that they can create a coordinated response to these more modern data oriented regulations. And, and so there was a lot of discussion, well, um, there are many metadata standards, why doesn't everybody use them? And these, these metadata standards are very good, but they are limited in scope and they don't cover the whole space that needs to be managed. And so this is where the idea for um, Egeria was born. We originally started working with the Apache Atlas open source team because we thought that we would use Apache Atlas as the basis for an open ecosystem. But actually, um, it, it uh, very quickly became way too big um, to be a sort of add on to Apache Atlas. It really needed to be its, a project in its own right. And so the ODPI at that time was looking at for a new role and uh, Egeria was looking for a new home or the open metadata capability was looking for a new home. And that's really where Egeria was born. And it's, um, uh, it's as I say, two years old and a, a very active and uh, um, uh, uh, interesting project in terms of uh, how it's starting to enable this, uh, this uh, metadata exchange ecosystem. Because although different vendors have tried to create open APIs on their technologies, other vendors, of course, are reluctant to integrate with it. So what we need is a sort of um, uh, a neutral um, space where and APIs and protocols where vendors can feel safe in integrating, that they will still be able to deliver the value that they've created in their products but also release the knowledge that um, is coming from their users to um, allow uh, other decisions to be made, but also to receive uh, the metadata, receive metadata from other tools. So when a new tool is coming into the organization, it comes in empty. We connect it to the open ecosystem and uh, that tool now, you know, starts knows about the data of the organization and can start delivering value. So that's really the idea of Egeria, and I'll take you through some of the uh, the functions and content that it's um, that has been created for it. So, um, if we if we sort of said, you know, what what is the uh, elevator pitch for what Egeria is doing? And it, it's very simple. It's try creating um, protocols and APIs to allow tools from different vendors, from different parts of the life cycle, for different professions. Um, to exchange metadata. And we always draw it as this bar because we can't have a sort of everybody integrates with a central repository. It has to be a peer-to-peer -peer environment. We have to let each tool operate with its own repository in the way it's always done. But then we need to augment that um, existing uh, function with those white arrows that allow this peer-to-peer. -peer. It's got to be fair otherwise vendors won't play in it's got to be functional it has to ensure the integrity of this metadata uh, so we can't allow a rogue tool to disrupt and uh, um, and create uh, um, uh, incorrect metadata in this ecosystem because as you start to look at the more advanced uses of metadata it tends to be it can be used for security for identifying um, uh, where uh, sensitive data is, uh, sorting out data breaches, responding to regulators. So this metadata is very important to an organization and needs to be treated as valuable data effectively. So I've talked about its peer-to-peer, multi-vendor, um, and it also needs to be very comprehensive. So um, this next picture um, it's got a sort of patchwork quilt look to it, but you can also see that there are lots of connections between lots of different types of data. So what we did as a very early exercise was to look at all of the um, many hundreds, almost thousands of metadata standards, and they're good. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with these metadata standards, but they each cover 
a particular very specialized topic and what we've done is we've knitted them all together um, mapped them and, sh and and also looked at many use cases from different regulations from different organizations and so what linkage do we need to establish between these different concepts that are described in, in the different metadata standards and the result is um, uh, nearly 500 different types of metadata that need to be be supported by an organization and, and it, this number is growing we started with about 400 uh, two years ago i said oh it's 400 types now it's 500 as our use cases expand and they are um uh, what we call entities so these are facts nodes collections of, of concepts and yes objects maybe you call them and relationships between them so this particular data has this policy applied to it or this meaning attached to it or this classification attached to it so we have this notion of things and relationships between things um, and we also have a special thing called a classification which is like a label that says this thing is of this is like this group so we can we can talk about things that are data that is sensitive for example so sensitive is a classification um, and then so we have these three basic ideas and then the type system is built to say um, there's the idea of a data set that's an entity it has um, this, these types of properties associated with it and as a data set it can be connected to the following things so it can be connected to a glossary term which is also an entity and there's a special type of relationship between them called semantic assignment so that's how the very basic thing so this gives us a language uh, that the tools can integrate with so they basically if you were a database uh, management system you say well i talk i know about databases okay they're a type of there's a thing called a database um, and i have tables and columns and then there's something in the metadata model that talks about tables and columns and how they relate together so that starts to, to say you know we have different database vendors saying oh okay that's how i fit my metadata in um, my database fits in and so that mapping as each vendor maps to the same model we start to understand the correspondence between the different uh, the, 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 the different technologies and, and, and the data that they store so that's really what the the base model supports and so we can start to understand um, you know how how consistent and um, how common actually metadata is across the thing um, but now we need to connect the tools together and uh, today's world is even more complicated um, and is getting uh, you know is, is getting uh, increasingly complicated so uh, not only do organizations have many different data centers but they're also using multiple cloud vendors so their data is not just inside their um, enterprise walls, their company walls, but it's also being hosted by third parties. Um, applications are not just um, sitting inside um, sort of large computers and data centers, whether on the cloud or in, in, in on premises, but they're also out in the devices we use every day in our mobile phones, we're storing data. Uh, which there are many different types of sensors and I IoT, Internet of Things, uh, devices and systems that are also storing data. And, uh, and so we're looking at places where data is stored, where metadata is being kept, uh, that is becoming highly distributed and also highly variable in terms of the platforms that it's running on. Um, and the uh, number of vendors that are involved. So what Ageria needs to be able to do is to take, um, is, is to be able to take, if you imagine the metadata that's being stored in all these systems is the orange cylinders and Ageria is connecting these together through the dotted lines and it has to um, follow the topology of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the deployment for a particular organization and bring that together in, a, in an effective way to give the impression that there is a virtual metadata repository, I'll say, although we don't centralize metadata. The other thing that organizations are doing is they're also talking to um, 
so I'm um, so I've got another question, which is excellent. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to um, I'm going to respond to actually to these questions because they're they're very good. So the first question is um, for the metadata repository, AWS Glue Glue is widely used. Does Ajuria work or is compatible with that? So it is perfectly possible to build a connector. So the way Ajuria works is that third party technologies plug into Ajuria. So Ajuria has lots of plug points for different types of technologies. And that the thing you plug in is called a connector. And so there are connectors for metadata repositories. And you could build a connector for AWS S glue. Um, and that could be provided either by the Ajuria project team if um, they felt that that was uh, valuable or provided by AWS or a third party um, provider. The interfaces they um, are, are very clear and the uh, the, the connection and the, the uh, sort of plug-in nation of nature of it is handled by configuration. So it's possible to uh, connect in lots of different types of technology through our different interfaces. And a little bit later on, I will talk, start talking about uh, those different choices as well. So that, that was one question, so good question. And the next one I've got here is, does ODBI have tools for exchanging metadata between blockchain platforms? Um, or perhaps are they working on such tools? So again, the question is um, uh, is around the, um, the the plugin nature. So there's there there is uh, no reason why you can't build connectors between any type of third party technology. Uh, what we typically try and do is to get uh, to to we focus very much on minimizing the amount of code that's required to connect in any technology. So rather than having one very generic plug point that everybody codes to. We um, are creating an increasing number of specialized plug points that um, there may be one that's very focused towards ETL tools, another that's very focused towards database engines, um, another that's very focused towards BI or reporting tools, so that the mapping that's required for a particular uh, vendor or third party implementation is as little as possible. So. Um, I'm not sure in terms of what, in when we talk about changing between blockchain chain platforms, whether we're looking at an application style integration where that's using multiple blockchain platforms or whether we're actually looking at a low level integration between blockchain platforms, I would suggest that those are two different types of connectors. But either are possible um, and whether we simplify that process through a new specialized connector is really a question of discussion rather than um, a, a problem with the, uh, the with the interface. So uh, so the, the simple answer is yes. Uh, the complicated answer uh, is the um, is is uh, is exactly how we would do that integration to uh, get the maximum value to everybody. Um, so I have a question here which says, any suggestions for the resources for further research? Uh, I'm not sure which one that is for. So if you could just expand that question um, as to whether you're asking for suggestions for research projects that we would love you to do um, or something different, just clarify that question and I'll come back to it in a little while. OK, so I'm going to go back into uh, more discussions about uh, about how Ajuria works. Um, and the picture that you've got on the screen here is showing all these dotted orange lines between the different repositories. And I, oh, actually, what I was about to talk about was that um, organizations increasingly, when they're working with data, don't work with just themselves. They, uh, they also work with business partners. And the business partner might not want to connect up their tools and their metadata with um, with the, the, you know, with their, with their, their partner, with, with yourselves. But um, what we can do is pass, export um, metadata about a particular data asset um, in a standard format that can then be sent with the data and then can be loaded in when the data comes in. So you imagine um, a pharmaceutical company receiving information from a particular um, hospital the metadata there would would have all the terms and conditions about how that pharmaceutical company is allowed to work with that data. So that's also supported by Ajiria by providing that open um, open format. 
and and what um, inspired us on that was actually the way that digital photographs work today. You can take a digital photograph on any type of camera. Lots of metadata about the camera settings, where you were, um, and uh, what date and time it was, is incorpor incorporated into the the photo, and then you can. Um, use uh, many different vendors photo albums and library type um, tools and that metadata is readable because it's both open in format and included with the, the photo so that's what we're trying to accomplish with business data um, in this in this particular function so let me have a little look at the questions to see uh, um, if I've got any more to go right now okay now let's let me let me continue on, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what, about the infrastructure underneath, and um, and uh, make sure that uh, and, and 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 how that works. So, uh, this high level picture is actually from our website, um, which you'll see on GitHub, um, and it tries to describe uh, how you do what it looks like when Ajira is deployed. So you imagine the green. Uh, clouds are all the different places where metadata and tools, platforms, and information about um, an organization's IT data, people, activity is uh, located. The blue boxes are what we call the Egeria Open Metadata and Governance Platform, or OMAG platform, or OMAG, OMAG server platform, you'll see its proper name. And, um, and that basically, you put one of those in each place. And it is able to host uh, what we call um, servers or OMAG servers. I think I've called them Nigeria servers here. And each server hosts a connector to a tool. And depending on the type of uh, connector you want, you use a different type of server. And the server type um, has code that we provide that does all the blue arrows, that connects it all together and makes sure that that particular tool connector is notified when something interesting for that particular tool type is available and also make sure that the um, the information that's coming from the tool is properly distributed to everyone else so all the, the sort of the orange dashes in the previous section and is is handled under the covers uh, by Ageria um and i'm just checking the questions again i think we need to have a bit more to give a bit more time for some more questions um so let's look a little bit more detail about these orange circles here and uh, the servers or omag servers is um if you want to look up on our website to find out a little bit more and these pictures are all from github and our um and our web pages so that, so if you want to learn more you can go and and look at uh, look at the information and uh, and see and see more so orange circles which are as i say the omag servers open metadata and governance servers is their full name um, and here you can see the hierarchy and so basically generically the open circles are called omag servers and there's three main types cohort members are for doing peer-to-peer -peer exchange of metadata view servers provide rest apis for user interfaces including our own um, and we keep that in a separate type of server so that it can be separated by a firewall from the metadata itself. So it's just a sort of useful architectural separation that uh, helps people when they're deploying Ageria um, to make sure the security is in place. And then we have another type of server, which is a governance server. And this helps us provide additional value on top of the metadata. So if you think of the cohort members, are like the messengers for passing metadata around and the governance servers are for adding value, making more use of metadata, whether that's distributing it to third party tools or um, actively uh, ex receiving metadata from third party tools that have no metadata integration or providing automated metadata discovery or stewardship services. That's the things that the governance servers do. So I always, always think of those as the value add on top. And then for each of these broader types, we have specific um, subtypes um, that uh, do uh, that do specific jobs. So when we look at the cohort members, 
Uh, we provide something called a metadata access point, and this provides a whole series of specialist interfaces for different types of tools. And uh, so this allows you to integrate directly. So there's one for called Data Engine OMAS that has uh, specialist APIs for ETL engines, another one called Data Manager, which has specialist interfaces for databases, file systems, file managers, content managers, etc. And the list goes on. There's, there's a 25 different types of interfaces for different types of tools. And then we have a metadata server, which is um, uh, also can be an access point, but it also provides storage. Uh, and that's very important because if you have one tool that, for example, supports the ability to define ontologies and glossaries, and another tool that's able to describe data sets, but neither supports the other metadata. If we want to create relationships between them, we need a place to store those relationships. And so that's the job of the, the metadata server here. The Ajiria metadata server is fulfilling gaps. So if you imagine um, crazy paving where you've got lots of different um, uh, plat, um, pieces of uh, uh, stone with different shapes, and then you put concrete between them to hold them together, I feel that it, the Ajiria metadata server is the concrete and the, the slabs of all different shapes are all the different third party technologies we are integrating. So that's the access point and the metadata server. The repository proxy is a host for connectors for metadata servers. Um, and you'll see that in a minute. And then the conformance test server is a server we can connect into a cohort and it will start validating that um, one of the members is behaving correctly and it will it will test the consistency through the API through its events and pass it valid and invalid bits of metadata. So we use that in environments where a vendor wants to validate that they are integration into Ageria is safe um, and that's what the test server does and we have a conformance program that sits with it so vendors can display that they are they have a safe integration into the open metadata ecosystem so that's the cohort members talked about the view server and then the different types of um, of uh, governance servers are um, uh, the integration daemon is for uh, exchange metadata between uh, third-party tools that don't integrate inter integrate directly with Ajiria. Uh, the put dis discovery server hosts uh, discovery engines for doing automatic metadata discovery, so they could do quality rules, profiling of data sources. Um, it could be uh, uh, actually running different types of analytics and um, on data sets and creating results. So that's the discovery server, and the discovery server might um, be doing something like deduplication of metadata so you know you've got two tools they've both loaded in information about the same database and have shared it and now we've got two copies of the same asset so the discovery server can do deduplication and, and identify where it thinks we have multiple copies of the same asset and then the stewardship server is for uh, running remediation allowing uh, triage of these uh, uh, of, of, of issues raised by the discovery server or raised by any other system in the ecosystem. So it's uh, it's really where the humans can interact and make changes to the open ecosystem. Uh, the security officer server is for um, configuring um, complex uh, uh, security requirements around uh, the use of a particular data based on metadata values. And the open lineage server provides um, it's it, a historical view of lineage from many different uh, technologies. So we have, as you can see, a very wide variety of uh, project of, of, of servers uh, that are in various stages of development. Some are um, shipped and uh, um, and are and sort of active and ready for production use, and others are in development. And that's the interesting thing about this project is that we do everything in the open through GitHub so that people can be watching and as new interfaces come out they can comment on it before it's fixed um, and we find that this is a very valuable way of enabling the community and our consumers to guide us to make sure that we create the most valuable interfaces and uh, events and other types of integrations um, as possible now a little look at the questions i think that's all fairly static so let's keep going um, so uh, there's a, a, a sort of um, 
a standard way that these different types of service connect together. And I've shown them as a series of rings. So in the center is what this, the cohort members, we talked about those, and they talk. Um, they, they have two main communication mechanisms. When they, the, the cohort is a dynamically um, organized and configured environment. So basically a new server comes in and puts a registration document on the central topic and says, hello, I'm here, I want to join. And the other members look at that information. Uh, if, as long as there's no problems with it, they then reconfigure themselves to have a new member and um, send information about themselves to the new member. And all, th or, or, you know, so now we say we had two and now we've got three members are configured to talk. And, and it means that when they issue a federated query, metadata from all of the members is included. Um, and if at a later stage a, a repository leaves the cohort, then they send out an unregistration request and all the other members are um, uh, reconfigure to remove that particular server. So it means that, um, as I say, there's no central control beyond providing um, a shared topic in something like Apache Kafka um, to provide that mechanisms. So um, the topic can also be used for um, a background notification mechanism to say that uh, various pieces of metadata in each of the servers has been uh, changed as well. So repositories are able to cache metadata from other repositories um, through through the, the cohort mechanism. So that's the heart of the environment and as I say gives you both uh, gives you access to all of the metadata in all the members um, from any point. Then we've got the governance servers I talked to you about the three different four different five different types I think it was uh, the integration daemon the uh, um, Discovery server, stewardship server, uh, open lineage server, and uh, this security officer server. They sit in the next layer out, and this is providing that extra value add. Um, so in the middle here, we're just exchanging metadata. The integrated governance, we're trying to make take uh, make additional value from that. And then the final thing, the view servers and then the UIs and things like that, are adding. Um, the sort of governance solution, the support for business users doing uh, governancey things uh, through the interfaces. So that's how we sort of build out an, an environment. And if you were uh, planning to have this in your own organization, you would probably look at the different tools and things you have deployed and uh, think about um, you know which ones you want to be integrated. And then based on their type, you would uh, a look at the different interfaces for that particular type and that and maybe you create connectors to create that integration and then depending on their type they would plug into one or the other of these servers types um, and then uh, you would configure them to, as, you, as you configure them they would uh, basically follow this pattern um, in in its process and there are a number of things like we always say make sure you have a metadata server in your cohort so that any additional metadata has a place to go um, uh, because often third party metadata servers only support the metadata that they can work with, which is quite reasonable. Look at the questions, that's looking OK. Um, and let's move on. So uh, I mentioned uh, earlier on that there are a huge number of different deployment uh, platforms and scales that we need to support. And so the idea of this OMAG server platform and the servers that sit on top, um, it has enabled us to be very flexible in our deployment. Um, we have also quite strict coding standards around bringing in dependent libraries to keep our footprint at a point where we can run it on a Raspberry Pi, but we can also do horizontally scaled deployments. Uh, using Kubernetes um, to support very high workloads. Uh, and that's because of the fact that uh, right from the start, Nigeria was um, architected to be this integration platform that has to go everywhere. We also um, divide our um, technology into three layers, and this is very similar to the, the circular piece, but 
at our heart, we're a developer's platform. So we provide libraries and things that vendors can take and other third party technologies can take and embed in their products to give them open AP, open metadata capabilities. Um, and uh, there's also at the base is a connector framework and that provides the uh, plugin architecture. So all of our plugins are done through connectors um, that follow a consistent framework. And then depending on the type of connector, there's a specialist interface that augments the core uh, connector interface uh, that um, allows uh, the connector to behave in a certain way or support a particular type of technology. So that's the developer platform. And we could have stopped there, but the integration platform is saying, well, it would be really helpful to have a library of pre-built connectors and also a user interface to allow people who are running Ageria to really monitor the entire integrated ecosystem end to end and uh, to make sure that it's operating functionally uh, and then also utilities to allow different types of files of particular formats so you know make might have a design model in a json ld format so you might want to load that into the ecosystem so it can be distributed that's really what the integration platform is doing. It's saying, here is something that you can use out of the box to start to integrate your metadata in your organization. And then on top of that, we're building governance solutions, which are things that organizations um, who maybe they're starting their governance journey or are looking to fill a gap in what they're currently deployed, could take a jury and use that as their core metadata and governance function. Um, and so that's really where the governance solutions come in. And uh, we uh, basically started at the bottom. So let me show you that in a bit more detail on the next chart. So here you can see more of a sort of traditional block diagram, but it's to say the bottom piece is that developer platform. So you can see all the different libraries and you can see the services that are plugged into the different types of, um, of servers that I've talked about before. And in this corner here, you see content, open metadata types, that's the 500 types. And the type system is completely dynamic, so you can define your own types. But by sticking with the ones that are defined by uh, the Ageria project, uh, you increase the chances that your metadata will be shareable um, across a wider range of technology. Um, and we also use those types to build our solutions on top. So again, using the open types, means that there will be uh, further capability that will exploit that metadata. So, um, yeah, as I say, right at the bottom here, you can see the connector framework, which is our plugin thing. Then the discovery framework allows you to write discovery services that do this automatic metadata discovery. The governance action allows you to create plugins for different types of remediation and actions that you need to take around uh, issues in the um, open metadata space or even actually in the data space and then the audit log framework allows a monitoring um, system to be plugged in and the um, operation of the Ageria ecosystem can be um, monitored or automated as necessary because we believe that um, automation is key where as, as, as humans we're really not very good at admin and um, and so the more that the Ageria ecosystem can be automated, can be self-managing, self-configuring um, and self-healing, then the more accurate and valuable metadata will be to the organization. So that was the bottom thing. Then we talked about the, the next level, which is that integration platform. And so there's a, a UI that is really designed for people running Ageria to understand that, that uh, integrated platform. The utilities allow us to bring in third party content um, and a lot of sort of files or um, things coming from uh, standards bodies and stuff. And then the connectors are um, pre built uh, connectors to different third party technologies. And uh, if you're looking, thinking this is a great project and you'd love to contribute. This is an area where you could provide tremendous value to the team in terms of connecting in your favorite technology into this ecosystem um, and uh, providing us with those connectors for other people to use. 
Okay, so that's the integration platform and then the governance solutions. If you're a governance person, you would start to recognize these names. If you're not, then uh, don't worry too much about them, but um, asset ownership and management. So this is around how you, you define who owns a particular, say, data set, who's responsible for classifying where the, the sensitive data is located, who gives access to that asset, all of those types of sort of responsibilities that are around uh, owning something of value. And the duplicate asset management is the support to um, work out when you've got copies, duplicate copies from different tools of the same thing. Secure database sandboxes uses metadata to create a secure um, access to data in, say, a corporate data lake and uh, create um, safe copies of that data for data scientists to work with. So that might have certain pieces of um, sensitive data masked out, etc. Um, and that will be done based on metadata. The historical lineage is um, um, a sort of UI to allow people to look at where things were, you know, what, what was the lineage of a particular a piece of data. So lineage is sort of what was the set of processes that actually provided that data. Um, and you can start to ask questions about um, the time, you know, sort of, okay, so it, it was working two weeks ago and it's not working now. What was the lineage two weeks ago? What has changed in those two weeks? That's really what this is all about. Subject area management is around capturing knowledge of a particular subject area. So a subject area could be customer, employee, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, could be uh, energy um, generation. So it's a topic that uh, people know about and there's terminology in that topic. There are rules in that topic. There are common data structures and standards in that topic. So the subject area management is about how do you manage those definitions that describe everything that should be common around data, APIs, systems uh, that work in that in that area. And then governance program management is around is for governance teams to define their policies and rules and the um, the different types of um, management options that that uh, have been defined. It's where you can define. Uh, sort of security classifications and manage terms and conditions around um, particular data and APIs. So that's the structure um, and one piece builds on another and since this is an open source project obviously not everything is finished um, and, we, and we, we're actually pretty proud of that that um, everything we do is done visibly. It's not, I'm not showing that to see if it's a uh, aha uh -huh. OK, everything is done uh, in the open, so you will see some modules that um, are clearly still being worked on. And there are other modules that have um, a lot of maturity in them. And so you'll see here we have these frameworks uh, and the large part of the developer platform is actually um, production ready and uh, um, in a very strong state. And then uh, work is going on. Most of our focus here is, is actually building at the integration layer. That's really what we're looking at. Um, and the view services are around UIs, and the UIs really sit up at this top level, so they're a little less mature than um, you will see in that repository services and access services. So over time, you'll see more and more of these boxes turning green um, as, we, uh, as we build out new function. And as I say, this is the area where um, we are delighted to get uh, to get help and um, so I've got a question here about whether we're having other projects for the ODPI so at the moment we've had a number of uh, different projects uh, different people with projects approach us but nothing um, but we haven't got anybody who's sort of in the process of, of joining at the moment so uh, um, we are um, very interested in uh, in new uh, in new projects and um, particularly um, if there's uh, you know, one or two um, companies that would like to work together in an open source way. This is really what the ODPI does very well, is, is that sort of uh, open and safe environment for competitors or people who work in slightly different industries and not used to working together um, to, uh, to come together and build something 
that is uh, not possible in an individual organizational environment. So, um, so there is there is an so we have we have um, three stages for a project. There is the incubation stage, um, and this is where the project is coming together. They're forming the team. The governance processes that the team is going to use are being defined. Um, and then once once the, the the project looks like it, you know the the, team, the people involved are happy to get going, and they're happy to bring in new members. Then we go into the um, into the active state, and uh, and that means that the project is running and it's it's active. And then finally, we have an emeritus stage. I think it's it's called emeritus when a project is uh, people have stopped working on it, nobody's interested in it anymore, and it is just being shut down. So. Um, so yes, we have we have a, a three stage process for projects um, going forward. It's uh, good, thank you. Um, and okay, let's get to have a little look um, at some of the other things that we've been doing. So one of the things that we've discovered as we go through this process, this project, is that um, we're breaking all the rules. We're, we're ignoring the boundaries that have been set um, through the way that. Uh, product um you know software product markets work uh the way that organizations are organized and buy software um, and that creates that's the silos in organizations and the silos between different professions create silos in the software product market um but that has created you know that, that's a, that's meant that if you imagine two different groups they buy two different tools their knowledge is segregated and we put a jury in the middle and suddenly that that metadata is being shared and so it's possible that some of these assets um, that are being shared now are actually highly valuable or very sensitive and so we need to think about how we scope what people can see how we secure the metadata so we're, we are enabling it to be shared but we also need to be responsible and say and, and provide very um, accurate and fine-grained control over who can see what. We need to think about how do we create this environment so it can be self-configuring, self-managing and whatever. So in many respects, we are doing a lot of research type work in and, and, and solving problems for the very first time because we've never been in a situation where we've brought together metadata from so many different places. Um, and uh, so, um, and, and even, um, so we have uh, so so even around uh, the visualization, there's been some some very interesting work done uh, because the internal model. I talked about these entities, relationships, and classifications. You can think about this. We represent metadata logically as a massive virtual distributed graph. So how can we take advantage of the fact that we have that? Um, and so. Um, these screen captures come from a new user interface we have called the Repository Explorer. And it allows you to step through the entities and the relationships, irrespective of the projects, of the products or servers that they're actually coming from, and, uh, and build a view of um, a certain piece of knowledge. And so this has been a very interesting research project in terms of how should a, a person interact with a graph so it's not just a question of doing a query and throwing a graph on the screen you want to be able to allow people to um, choose how the graph is expanded and select different types of um, nodes and so thus this is um, the result of that work is is is, is shown in our repository explorer um, and we have another tool called the type explorer which is uh, a way of actually looking at those 500 types and being able to look at um, types with respect to an entity or types with respect to a relationship uh, and again that was a very interesting um, exploration in different ways of visualizing uh, graph data so we do that type of work as well as the very uh, middleware focused data integration type work that's going on in the cohort and uh, the other integration environments uh, that's going on As with all of our projects, GitHub is where everything is located. So if you go to our GitHub repositories, we've got um, I think four or five uh, repositories, but they all start at Jiria. Um, and um, 
you can see again how firstly how vibrant um, and how fast paced this project is uh, but also get involved in the, the different pieces of work associated with GitHub we have a slack channel as well which will allow you to ask questions and uh, we have uh, weekly calls too uh, so I've got a question here, uh, which is an interesting one for this conference. It says, does IBM provide behavioral data, e.g. banking fraud data, industrial? Uh, I don't really think I can answer that question. I think you need to ask IBM that, um, that, uh, that question, um, as that's not really something that we can answer in an open source um, environment. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so sorry, let's go back onto this. So. Um, yeah, so, so as I say, we don't we don't have anywhere else. Um, we just have um, uh, we just have GitHub and, uh, and and the Slack channel and the calls that you can join and and, and be a part of. Doing on time, uh, not too bad. Right, so um, I took I, I I mentioned the fact that we have the technology and also that there is an educational aspect to this. And so one of our GitHub repositories called Data Governance um, has um, it's, it's been used to develop out a series of best practices. So we've got um, a set of personas um, that um, are all characters from a fictitious company, which is a pharmaceutical company that is going through a massive transformation. They're going from creating uh, drugs that are uh, generically usable to personalize medicine and that means from a data point of view rather than releasing a new product every six months or to a year they're having to have a very tight integration from research sales manufacturing um, on an individual basis so the whole of their IT ecosystem needs into infrastructure needs to be changed the way they operate as a business needs to be changed they need to work with business partners uh, digitally rather than in a much slower sort of person-to-person -person type way and so we're using this as an example to show how integrating metadata how good governance practices um, can help a business do this type of business transformation and uh, and all of this is documented in our um, what we call the guidance on governance the GOG and uh, we then take those best practices and link them down to and this is how you do it in Nigeria so this is basically to come to bringing practitioners and somebody who's suddenly been told oh by the way you're the chief data officer gives them a place to go it will help them think through the questions and types of issues that they need to tackle in their own organization and then hopefully give practical advice on how they would take that forward um, so uh, that's that's basically trying to help practitioners uh, to practical solutions as well as uh, providing support to vendors to allow them to plug into this ecosystem so that their tools give the maximum value to the to their customers um and um and have a much um lower cost of ownership and a faster time to value uh because of the fact that they're, they're, they're able to plug into the organization's knowledge um knowledge base uh, from, from 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 day one so that's that's Algeria. i have a little picture here that just sort of shows what we're trying to do with Algeria. i've spent most of the time on this one uh, because it is the biggest project um, and um, it's uh, and th th there's there's a, there's a lot to it but the other two projects are still important to the ODPI and um, we're hoping that um, the data science aspect from open data science for all and Nigeria so Nigeria will, will probably provide a module on governance and management to the ODP, uh, the data science piece and as we enable our data science APIs, then hopefully they will tie back into the education material. Uh, similarly, with the BI and AI, um, you can see the opportunity for integration between those projects as the BI and AI come up with their bridge um, definitions. So we see um, ourselves as part of a, a collective family that we're each um, working together, and that's what the ODPI gives us. Um, but it, 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 but also each project has a very um, focused uh, mission, 
uh, and set of uh, consumers that they're trying to serve as well. So um, I think we are at the end. So I have a chart here for questions. Um, and so we've had some great questions during the session. Let me have a look, see if I've missed anything um, in the questions here. Um, I can't see anything. So if anybody's got any more questions, I am very happy to answer them. Let's give people a minute or two. And uh, yeah, I didn't put up any any links uh, to show today, but if you search for ODPI Nigeria, you will certainly get to our websites, uh, since that's a pretty um, and all open data, open DS for all that will that will bring you to the ODPI. But ODPI will on its own will probably bring you to our main homepage as well and then you can navigate to the different projects of interest okay uh, so there's a question here about how do we fund all of this so um the odpi is um a foundation in, um, in its own right and uh, organizations that um, value our work can become members and there are different levels of membership uh, that an organization can um, choose to join at. There's a, a premier level for people who want a board uh, place that will allow um, you to input in how we spend our money. Uh, then there are other levels. Um, and so really the, the value of membership is that you get to um, you get to influence, you get to be to support the work that we're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, just basically um, have your logo on our, our website to say publicly that these are valuable projects that, that you're supporting. So uh, yeah, so it's, so we have, um, our funding comes from our membership fees, but you don't need to be a member to be, take part in the projects, to make use of the technology. All of that is, is free and open. Mm. So there's a question is, where is the online reference for examples of use cases? So that is um, in the GitHub repository under the ODPI. So if you go to GitHub, ODPI slash data dash governance, and you'll see the use cases there. We are also improving our documentation around different solution um, um, examples in the main Nigeria repository as well. So it, uh, it's always a an ongoing um, uh, development in that we're always we're not only improving the code but we're improving our documentation all the time. Uh, so I think I've covered that one. Covered that one. I think yes. Uh, can't see any more questions. Right, so um, and if anybody um, would like to contact me, you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Mandy Chessel, um, and that's a fairly unique <laughs> unique name, so you should be able to to find me and my name's at the front of the piece, or you can contact um, um, me or any of the other people involved in the ODPI through the ODPI website or through GitHub um, and our SAC channels. All right, I think we are out of questions. One more check. Yep, that looks like it. So uh, um, I think we're finished for today. So thank you all so much for both listening and also providing me with uh, an excellent set of questions. Um, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you very much.